so glad to be here. Um, I'm going to do a series of poems. I'm a spoken word artist, and these are stories about my sisters, and that's what I've titled it. Um, so I'm going to start off with a, a warm-up called Black Girl, a big girl poem. And this is because it's a poem to black girls, to myself. Um, when I was a bit larger than I was, and it's what I would have wanted people to say to me about um, what beauty is and that it can exist in all sorts of shades, colors, and shapes, and sizes. And this is Big Girl Poem. So. To the plus size girl I once was. The full cream, double thick, and then some girl. The girl I barely see on billboards. That size 16 girl. Honey, I wish someone could have told you just once that you are a wonder, something to go to and never come back from, a four-way stretch of hips, thighs, a bum, and a waist with enough room for a man to stand his soul in and jive in, and he will jive like his feet have just learned to laugh with a mouth wide open, and he will hide in you from a world too busy making dream catches out of him and he will stay this old dog in desperate devotion to your curves until you grow tired of him and his fragile voodoo big girl do you see how great you are you are beautiful off track and just right you are good food and all too much laughter in that round tummy of yours and many Many, many men will go to war for you, unwilling to relinquish even a piece of your right cheek to someone else's lips, wanting every last string of you, the unhealthy bit especially, wanting all of your too much in skin and arms, and no one will have warned them of your seas and their moons, and they will sink into you and come back begging for seconds and thirds and fourths, hungry for the heat of their hand in yours, because no one can hold them like you. And this world can't stand it can't walk next to you or past you without sneering at the excess of your splendor that anyone could love you, all of you, and the sinful parts you hide from lovers when the lights are turned off is a surprise their jaws are still making their way back from. And when they recover, they will call you fat and chunky. They will say this makes you ugly. You will be the dirty secret whose clothes they hide in the back of a shop. But this, this is just envy, honey. They envy your audacity to love your food so publicly. This world is irritated pink by your nerve to wear your food so tightly around you like the hug of a good looking man. And they want some of that loving too. So next time, when you're in a club, dance harder than the tacky disco lights. Swing the apple crumble, crumble chocolate character of your arms wildly. But don't forget to stop and check that your hair is still in place. And then find your reflection. Thank your body for its wide grounding because it is good enough and better. <laughs> Right. That was that was that was a warm up. <laughs> that was a warm up. Um, this poem is called Hair, and it always surprises me how um, black brothers think they have an opinion on how black women should have their hair, whether it should be weaved out, natural, what it should look like. And my hair happens to look like this right now because the hairdresser got my sides with some glue. So I didn't have a choice, I had to cut it. Um, so I have this sexy, pseudo cool look going on right now. Um, but yeah, this, this is the poem. On how to be a real black woman. Facebook conversations with black boys who think they know my hair, what it should look like if they are looking which continent it should grow in, how many foreign languages, ships, currencies it can pass through to then be real. I don't know why you keep having these conversations. 
If I told you my hair passed through customs three times, funded the education of two children in India, belonged to a Samson who'd let love get the better of him and then recovered, would you forgive my hair? <laughs> you talk a lot about something we barely permit you to touch or wake up to. So this is for the man in whose knee-bowing, Beshu-speaking, authentic African fantasy, my hair is dressed up as 70s resistance in. The man who will fuck a weave but marry a natural sister, the man from St. Andrews who will ask in his most African English accent, how as a sister, sister, you can be real or real, real, receding from under the confidence of a weave. That is limp white courage, and you are beautiful as you were, Nubian coils and bold face. You don't look like yourself, he will say. He will throw his words in your mouth. They will taste like five fists coming for your voice to make you the slurs in African history books, to keep your words misplaced with the knives they sharpened inside them. Don't shout. No matter how tempted your words are for him, don't. This will only be proof of your hysterical inferiority. Remember that he's real, real, real. It's not durable. Nothing man-made will not break, expire, or give up on itself. And blackness, blackness is not wedged inside your hair. It's a work song given to us by the grass underneath our feet and the sweaty rocks we break to make from the sun inside them our shine. Blackness could be a top fade with the sides gelled down. It could be the beginning in teeny weeny afros. It could, but her blackness is not the yes or the no in your words. Wow. Right, this is called, this is called Big School, this one. Um, and Big School, I'm from Krugersdorp, which is really like an Afrikaans kind of town. And uh, I was going into the orthodontist to get my braces done, so the smile is all pay paid for. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and and um, my mother's a very close woman, and she's like very light. She never raises her voice, but um, when she talks, you know to get yourself correct. Fix your situation right now, otherwise all hell's going to break loose. And my mother was signing these orthodontist forms, and this Afrikaans woman on the other side says, Hey, men, these African names are so hard. And my mother just looks at this woman like, hmm. Now, I, I don't know about you, but when my mother goes, hmm. I know something's about to go down. It's going to get real for this person. And my mother says, and like she's got a closer English accent, she says, do you think Van der Merve comes easy to my tongue? <laughs> and she just keeps, she keeps writing like, and I'm there like, yo, mama, oh, oh. And, and so um, as I was writing Big School, I had all of that, you know, to, to come back to. And the fact that my name is Vuyelwa, but I've heard like Vuyalwa, Vuhalwa, every other. And I was like V for the longest time. Um, so this is what I came into this poem with, and this is called Big School. <laughs> On the first day of Big School, when the teacher lowers her glasses, the old couple held together by a weary frame, her shaky hands rocking the glasses down her crooked nose to sit their heels in the trench of skin dug for the time she needed to stand her eyes taller over them so she could sprint a scowl at the naughty boy with the hot dog on his shirt. Today, her misty glasses are lowered for a scowl at you when she asks, what? Is your name? But you've practiced saying your name on a playground with friends. Know the mermaid's skin it was sewn from. Could pick out the sound of each vowel jumping on top of a zinc roof in a rainstorm. Your name could play a game of hide and seek. And you, who knows it as well as your mother does, would find it. Hear it giggle underneath the sofa. Spy the small body, hold its breath in between the mist of leaves in your neighbor's backyard. And since you don't know how to hate your name yet, don't know how to want it to be easy, a stripper's nickname maybe, you answer proudly. Lerato, Teñeco, Buitumelo. Answer through custard cheeks with your parents' promise for you. And when they ask for something easier, know 
that all promises worth making should dry your mouth out and that you are a language without acronyms. To the child sitting in a classroom with tables that could swallow you when she asks you, don't you have a Christian name? And then picks up the name list, twists her eyes at your name to try to find something her tongue can lift and then reluctantly pushes you out in syllables like a smelly meal eaten on a sweltering summer day in front of a garden boy she named Alex. This will be your first injury in big school. But all your mother will remember are your brave fingers and how they found friends and eventually let go of her. The shiny polish of your feet. And she couldn't tell whether your smile was nervous or uncomfortable, but she will remember this as a beginning for you. It will not be the last time. You will have to repeat your name, to call it off a ledge, built by a language that only lets us rent it for public appearances and university applications and poems like this, but it is still not ours. So to my children, I will say, in the language of their names, every lump in your name is my demand on the world for you. Let those who cannot fulfill each letter choke on it. Besides, it'll be hard to pronounce a name with so many tribes in it, but still make them say it because only the people who can say it can see you. And baby, your soul it has a face worth seeing. Thank you so much. <laughs>